This is a Mari podcast. Hello, you are listening to Mobility World. I'm Lukman Haris. Mobility World is a part of the plugin with Mari Podcast Network. And today we're going to talk about something that's very related to the pandemic that we are in now. Um, well, medicine, telemedicine, and of course, the topic that everyone's been talking about, vaccines. Some of you may have heard of BookDoc. Now, I got to admit, the first time I heard of BookDoc, I thought it had something to do with books. Maybe a platform to buy or sell books or review books or something like that. But I was glad that I was wrong because it's about something much bigger than that. BookDoc is actually about connecting patients with with uh, healthcare providers, maximizing on technology to bridge the gap, bridge the distance and bridge whatever difficulties that patients may have to access their healthcare provider, doctor, etc. Founded in 2015, six years later, fast forward, it is now operating in five countries and lists uh, around 40,000 healthcare professionals. So joining me today is its founder and CEO, Dato Chevy Bay. Dato Chevy, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. First of all, tell us about BookDoc a bit. Um, I know this question has been asked a lot of times, so I'm just going to tweak it a bit. The story of BookDoc and the story of yourself. Yep. Not many people know that you are the heir to the BP Healthcare Empire, yep. but you chose not to, well, pursue that. Yep. You chose to start something from scratch. Now, you already had, I assume, the infrastructure, the machinery, the network that comes with BP, um, but you chose to start something from zero. Why? Because I think in life, it's important to challenge yourself. Everything given to you, life is not so meaningful. That's how I look at it. If you create something from scratch by yourself, it's more fulfilling and more meaningful too. Things given to you, there's nothing great about you. You are just lucky. So I want to show the world and show all the naysayers that, uh, yeah, any typical rich man, someone do something new. <laughs> a lot of them, they do pursue, but right. not very successfully. I could say I'm a bit more fortunate after... Five years plus, my company is still around. Normally, startup, after two years, they were bunkus balik kampung already. We are very happy. We are profitable. We are, we are making money and we are growing and touching people's life in a very positive way. So that keeps me motivated and that keeps the company going. Mm. And needless to say, in an industry that's quite challenging because it's very highly regulated, it's perhaps yeah. the most highly regulated yeah. industry, not just in Malaysia, but anywhere around the yeah. world. And you do operate in a few countries which have different sets of rules yep. when it comes to healthcare, which is mm -hmm. a very strictly regulated uh, industry. So, so what's the? Can you just roughly tell me how the business model is like from a layman's understanding, layman's point of view? Let's say mm. if I book uh, an appointment with a doctor yep. through your app, yep. I can just show up on the date and at the time. Yep. Very convenient. Correct. Um, so do I have to pay more vis-a-vis no. -vis going no. actually physically the old way to the no. hospital, etc.? No. It's easier. So you think of it like a Grab and Uber of healthcare. So you are here, you know all the clinics table you can book. But you may travel sometimes abroad for work or holiday in Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, Indonesia. You fall sick. You don't need to call the concierge and say which is the hotel, which is uh, the nearest doctor. You go to BookDoc, it will tell you all the nearest doctor to you and all the credential and we verify orders with Ministry of Health and to ensure that they are real doctors, they're not bogus, not fake doctors. So that is another very important point that I want to highlight in the BookDoc app. So the patients pay the same? Yes, correct. How do you make money then? So we make money from a few ways. So number one, we manage corporate employees. So number one is a corporate wellness program to ask the staff to be healthy. Number two, we also licensed by MOH and MOF to be a licensed TPA. So we process and we digitize all the claim process so you know your claims, entitlement, whether it's approved, rejected. And number three, we also have this thing called teleconsult. So today, back then, people always do teleconsult for second opinion or sensitive topic like mental health and sexual health. Today, there are a lot of people using telehealth for medical tourism. So a typical Indonesian who goes to Malaysia or Singapore all the time. Now it's not so convenient to fly. So they will use BookDocs Telehealth and we charge a fee. And on top of that, we work with a lot of insurance company to digitize the whole process and also reward their members to be more healthy. The healthier the members become, the less claim, the more profit they make. So there are a lot of multiple ways how we 
monetize, so to speak. And of course, another one is very traditional. We do marketing also. So meaning if you pay a bit more, your insurance will look up, pop up on the top or things like that. Yeah. Right. So, um, well, obviously the elephant in the room is that we've been facing a pandemic for for, for more than a year now. Yeah. Um, telemedicine. Yeah. Did you see a, like a surge, a spike increase of telemedicine relating to uh, BookDoc uh, when people are starting to be more afraid of actually physically going yeah. to hospitals and facing yeah. doctors and other people. Yeah, this is a, not a spike. It's a huge spike. So when we first started telemedicine, literally two months before the pandemic, it was only mostly people use it for sensitive topics like mental health and sexual health. That they want second opinion. And our system allowed you to chat anonymously so you can be a KOL, politician, celebrity. You can still reach out for help. But when COVID hit, we realized a few months later, these are the people who are using it they actually have no issue, but they are afraid to go to clinics. So they turn to telehealth. And now we also tie up with a delivery partner, Grab notably, and CityLink and a few other logistic company to send medicine to people's home as well. Mm. Yeah. Sending medicines to, to, to medication to people's homes, booking appointments, etc. This is what BookDoc yeah. does um, yeah. uh, to, to explain it simply. But when you talk about telemedicine, there's also the next level. Yeah. You know, actual consultations, yeah. remote consultations. Yeah. There are some places who are, that are even toying with the idea of, of, of doing remote surgery yeah. even. Now, for, for those later stages, mm -hmm. where is Malaysia? Uh, are, are we ready? Do we have our infrastructure ready to pursue something like that? Actually, I'm not sure if you're aware. After the US, US is the first country in the world that passed Telemedicine Act. Malaysia, under Tun M back then, was the second in the world that passed the, the act. But that's the act. Do, do, do we have enough to actually execute so, that? Perfectly? So one is the act first to make it legalized first, okay? Right. Number one. But of course, now you need a lot of fine-tuning, a lot of upgrade. But we're talking about infrastructure. I think we are not bad at all. Because we have three, four, and even five Gs. If you say you put this in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, I think the telemedicine will not work because the infrastructure doesn't support it at all. So this is very important. And I think in the whole Southeast Asia, besides Singapore, Malaysia is probably the second best. Do we have, how about the public's, you know, um, norms and, and their mindset? Does our society actually believe adequately in telemedicine, I'm talking about consultations yeah, sort of, yeah. uh, remotely, etc. Yeah. You can have all the acts, you can have all the infrastructure, yeah. but if people don't really believe in it, they still believe they're in the old way, they still prefer going physically yeah, to a hospital or to a clinic, uh, it will probably not take off as well as we want it to, to be. Um, are we ready in terms of our mindset? I think it's education and awareness. Once you try once or twice and it doesn't fail you, you will keep using it. But after once or twice you use it, it fails you miserably, you will give up. Just like any, any restaurant, you serve the best chakwe or nasi ayam. First time you feel the fella, the fella's not going to show up anymore. But if you serve as prescribed, as described, then they eat it and they feel, wow, this is as described, why not? So the same goes to the business of telemedicine also. Well, talking about infrastructure, um, there have there has been much talk about uh, our vaccine distribution infrastructure around mm -hmm. the country. Yeah. There have also been calls to uh, speed up the process. Yeah. There have been calls to involve the private sector or at least involve the private sector more in the vaccination yeah. program, which many perceive to be quite slow or at yeah. least um, not as fast as they would like it to yeah. be. What do you think of this call for the private sector, private hospitals, even clinics to actually be more involved in the vac vaccination process? I think the getting involvement of public-private partnership is a good thing. But of course, government is trying to protect the individual from not getting profiteering businesses. But business exists to earn a profit. So it's a very fine line. So there are certain doctors who say, I accept this consultation and this jab at 25 ringgit for argument's sake. But the doc, the MOH and the government only say, I can only pay you 10 bucks or 15 bucks. Take it or leave it. Then for them, they're like, hey, if I do this, I, I'm not really making money. So I might not want to be part of the panel, even though you allow the private to come in, which is what is happening currently as we speak. So they just want to see who are the hungrier one who are willing to take a big uh, discount or, or doing it as a CSR. So BookDoc is one of them who is doing this, one of the five companies doing this. And actually, we don't make money because we have to pay the doctors, nurses, pharmacies, coordinators, 
ushers. It's like for us, we have hired about 80 staff to do 2,500 patients per day. And 2,500, you multiply the fee they pay us, then you deduct my direct cost itself. I barely make any money at all. And Almost this, break even. Do you, you at least break even? Plus, minus, close to break even only. Yeah, you're talking about those patients, you're talking about uh, normal GP uh, treatments or vaccinations or yeah. still on the topic of vaccinations? Just vaccination or, itself. Right. Yeah. So you do facilitate vaccinations yeah. for involving yeah. private clinics so, yeah. or private Private doctors, hospitals? clinics, a hospital. So we group them together under our supervision. So we employ nurses, doctors, locums, etc. all together collectively. That's very admirable. Yeah. Do you think a lot of the private hospitals would follow suit and, and actually not look at any profit or at least just break even but to help the government vaccinate more people I faster? think it's, it's tough. Like they, they have very high overhead costs. They have nice facility. They got expensive machine. To ask them to throw price, then they said, oh, I'm a, I'm a Bentley or Rolls Royce. You asked me to sell at a proton price. I'm not interested. So <laughs> it's not that the government don't involve them. The government involve them, but they only play them a max, la, Honda rate. I say I'm a I'm a Bentley and I'm a Rolls Royce. How can you give me a, a Honda rate? I'm I'm not interested. So that is the issue. But if they pay them the Bentley and Hon Bentley rate and Rolls Royce rate, then the whole country will go bankrupt very fast. Yeah, I understand the the, the dilemma that yeah. the government is in because, yeah. well, of of course we are in the middle of the pandemic. The economy is suffering. Multiple yeah. MCOs, including the re most recent one. Yeah. Um, on top of that, a lot of you know um, stimulus programs that the government have yeah. to fund for yeah. small businesses who are suffering. So the government can only afford to pay so much. But yeah. is, uh, is this what's really happening now? The government actually has approached the private sector and yeah. private hospitals yeah. saying, hey, you need to help us now yeah. uh, increase the rate of the vaccination. Yeah. But basically the private hospital is saying, you, not with the rate you're paying, yeah. this is happening now. Exactly, this, this is a true fact. Any exceptions to the rule? Exception to the rule, they can go back to the existing player and say, I top up more, please scale up your business. How about, if not vaccinations, they can help the government in other ways. For example, um, public hospitals are really reaching the capacity now, yeah. ICU uh, utilization yeah, yeah, yeah. is more than 100%, etc. cetera. Um, f what if private hospitals, for example, take the non-COVID patients? Yeah, they can do that, but again, what price? Government is one ringgit, or specialist five ringgit. They say their total cost of doing uh, ICU is three hundred ringgit. I am a hospital. I say mine is five hundred ringgit. What can what is can it? the private sector, <laughs> private hospitals do then? We understand. Well, this yeah. is not lambasting them because they are yeah. running a business. Yeah, correct. They have to pay their employees. They have to pay yeah. their costs. Which correct. we understand that much. Understood. Um, but what then can they do? What, I need they, they, this is a business model that they have to be kind as studying medicine, doctoring 101, be kind and give back to society. Yeah, the Hippocrates oath, right? Yeah. Do no harm. Um, and they are just there to maximize the profit. Then you cannot really do much. If they say, okay, during this pandemic, we don't mind, we don't do the COVID one, never mind, because it's more money. We do the non-COVID one, but instead of charging the normal rate, say a thousand, we give 50% discount. So if that happened, then yes, then it will help clock up, decongest, and it's a win-win for all. But if they say, no, sorry, my rate is 1,000, I'm not giving any discount because I am a premier hospital, then sorry, then we are back to square one again. Okay, they can't do vaccinations because it'll be... Um, it's a loss-making thing. It's a loss-making thing. Yep. They can't probably take non-COVID patients as well. Yep. In your opinion, what can they do to... Something so like heart for surgery, to, yeah. eye surgery, orthopedic, all those, they can do it. But it's the rate they're charging. Yeah, I know. So taking into consideration the rate, yeah. what can they do to help the government so that maybe will probably do, not incur such losses that so, they can take? So maybe, like I said, since they, have, they are paying the doctors, they're paying this and that, at least charge at cost. Not profit, charge at cost. As a CSR for maybe say three months or six months, then they can revise the salary going, uh, revise the salary and the rates going forward after that. What do you make of the government's effort, uh, current vaccination efforts? They are encountering um, countless roadblocks, including the private mm. hospitals, mm. probably refusing to help because yeah. of the cost and etc. Yeah. Um, what else can the government do to actually speed up the vaccination process? I think right now, just to share with you, when we first started, they have five sites. So PWTC being yep. the one and the biggest, University Malaya, UKM, 
and also their own Satya Alam. So these are the four sites that they have currently as we speak. But the biggest one is PWTC. So when we first started, the daily traffic is 1,002 for per station. So three stations, 3,006. After that, it tempered about 800 every day. So about 2,004. Today, they're ramping up. We are hitting about 8,005 to 9,000 per day. So right now, I heard the latest one, the government are getting more vaccine by by June, yep. about 1.1 million. Now, yep. it's only 288,800. That one come June 1.1 and they got other very good volunteer. One of them, uh, NGO called Chuchi in Kepong. So they want to open up their hall and say, hey, my hall you can use for free. So if you can get more of this uh, location, like say if I'm Surat KLCC, I'm not making money anyways. I open up block uh, area, you can do a COVID testing there. Then the this malls. is the, the, the malls, or not necessarily more. They have a convention center. They open up or certain thing, maybe a mosque, a huge mosque, like I don't know, Shah Alam Mosque or Bukit Kiara Mosque. Open up just to do vaccine or a big temple. Why not? Then these are more sites to test. Then the take up rate will, will be faster because currently, as you speak, right, to hit huge immunity, they need 70, 80%. We have 33 million population. You do half is 18. But remember, it's not one jab, it's two jabs. So it's still 33 million. So with current capacity, it will take you maybe four, five years to finish up. But if they start doubling up and tripling up or quadrupling up, maybe fastest, one and a half, two years. Do we do we also have insufficient manpower? I'm talking about nurses, doctors on the ground to actually help administer the vaccines. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the venue, which is one point. Um, how about the 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 well the the manpower of KKM, the infrastructure or actually uh, even the, the the tools that we need mm. do we not have enough of those and is it time uh, I think right now they have bought a lot so I think as we speak I think we have sufficient for now so but if you want to ramp up again then we have to double up and triple up or whatever based on what volume you want to test per day or how many vaccine you want to vaccinate per day yeah so what do you think of our current vaccination rate. I think it's quite good. It's increasing every day, but I think they need to increase faster and find more venue so it can double, triple, quadruple it up faster. So hopefully by year end or beginning of next year, I would say 50-60% all done. Then it's back to normal. You don't need to wear your mask. I can see how good looking you are. You can see how good looking I am as well. Joking. That's probably truer. That's probably truer. And it's a pity that most people who are listening to this is on audio podcast only. Only. Can't see how good looking you are and how well dressed you are right now. But um, okay, book back to book doc, yeah. right? I know you are not uh well, well not you're you're not a private hospital, but yeah. you do what you can, yeah. and that's very admirable. So what's next for Book Doc in terms of helping the government to increase uh the speed or the efficiency, or in any way helping the government to up the vaccine? So rate? we we help government in multiple ways. The first one we started with this thing called cost plan active. So it's to promote community lifestyle. Because Average Malaysian walk 2,500 steps. So that's why we're the most obese country in the whole of Asia, <laughs> number one. Then lagi teh tarik, lagi tambah manis, tambah gula. Sorry lah, this doesn't help. And if you can park your car in the room, you will park the car in the room lah. So this is one we are doing with MOH and giving them the data. Oh, Kedah, Kelantan, this is worse. Can you please concentrate? One. Two, when COVID hit, we did lab uberization. So Tan Sri uh, DG was saying like, hey, a lot of people, we give vaccine for uh, the testing for free. But some of them don't qualify. They haven't been to high-risk country like China or Korea. I haven't been to Sri Petaling. They don't qualify. But they're willing to pay. Can you do it? So we did it. So now we are authorized by MOH to go to people's home and offices to do lab uberization of COVID PCR tests. Number two. Number three, we also realize this. A lot of people go line up in clinics and hospital and wait for their turn. And some take buses and the kids send them off. And we realize this is, hey, there's a big problem. Social distancing is not there, all the virus there. So now they are a must to book before they can go to the clinic using mm. book dog. Number four, how we work with KKM, another thing is of the 33 million, 20 million go and visit government clinics and hospital. Of that 70% are for follow up. I know you, I know your cat's name, I know your mom, I know where you live. What the hell, you can't see me. Only got critical, then right. come see me. Otherwise, we can do teleconsult. Fourth, then fifth is this vaccination we are doing now, coordinating. So we work with MOH in a lot of ways to help the country. What's your position on um, 
letting private hospitals actually, well, I don't want to use the word commoditize, but actually embark on the vaccination effort also. But yeah really putting a price on that because we were talking about the, the cost before yeah. and there, there are now also calls yeah. to for, for private hospitals to actually administer vaccines at a price and those who can pay yeah. uh, can get their vaccines faster. If yeah. they can pay, they can go to the yeah. private hospitals. Yeah. What do you think about it? Do you agree with that? I agree and disagree at the same time because right now all the vaccines are only for emergency use globally. So when, when I ask Pfizer and I ask Johnson Johnson, APEC boss. I say, can you sell to me so I can sell to people? He say, excuse me, not allowable. I say, why not allowable? Because this vaccine is under authorization of emergency only. So meaning government can buy only. Mm. Private sector cannot buy. No matter how multi-billion dollar company you are, you're not allowed to buy because it's a government mandate globally. But the government has recently just stated, I mean, the whole Penang uh, debacle, has led the government to actually say we have no objections for private entities to actually buy, but they have to go through the NPRA. Yeah, so right. still they still go through the government, see? Okay, it's not allowed now, but in theory. Do in theory, you... it's still you can't unless the government do a job. Unless the government fumble big time, then they only open up because again, they're also scared that this fellow take the vaccine. Say you got vaccine. I... I, my clinic has vaccine and I say, you come, I jab for you. Yeah, I understand. But how do you know if I'm japping with the real vaccine or I'm japping water? I understand. I don't mean in theory, sorry. I mean, I meant in principle. Would you agree if uh, private entities, private hospitals are actually allowed to sell vaccines at whatever rate so that yeah, at least they, some they, people They could, can they should, get but there must be a price ceiling. Yeah. Cannot be like you charge an arm and a leg ridiculously, then you're profiteering at people's expense at people's life expense. Do you think there are moral concerns? Because some are saying that, okay, then the rich can actually get, get vaccines faster. faster. Yeah. How so about us who can't afford it? So it's it? equality versus yeah. non-equality. Yeah. So that is a question again. So there's a moral question that I think the politician will be better answering this question. But from a purely medical standpoint, do yeah. you, would you support? Because some are saying that Okay, fine. There's, there's some moral concerns, but at least the faster we get more people vaccinated, yeah. regardless of whether they paid for of it course, or not, it's course. better. Of you course. subscribe to that thought? That, that one I agree. The more, the better. So like I myself have been vaccinated 10 days ago. So I took extra, so it's 80%. Any side effects? Uh, I think I look better. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> joking, joking. So I got my Astra as well. I just got a fever. I didn't. I did not yeah. look better. In, yeah. in, for, in fact, the next day I looked worse because I got a high fever. But I'm okay now. <laughs> but yeah, but a lot of stuff. My other colleagues got fever for two, three days. But it means that the vaccine is working. Yep. Because you're injecting virus to your body. Your body is reacting. You're responding, right? Responding. That's, that's the, the whole Correct. point. We're talking about Astra. Uh, but but the thing is now the government actually um actually uh took a very interesting steps because they yeah. opened the AstraZeneca yeah. vaccine, yeah. obtained, that's Obtain, how we yeah. got it, that's yeah. how I exactly. got it. Exactly. Um, now, at least as at the time of this recording, they are opening it up to those 60 and above, yeah. giving it a few days. Yeah. But last I checked, the take-up is really, really slow. Yeah. So now many people are saying that, you know, why aren't we opening it to more people or to yeah. more states? Agreed, agreed. It, agree? so, so number one is they give to the 60, if they want to give yeah. them the Waga a mask. But not realizing, you must know this, Waga Amas are not so tech savvy on the phone. They, are, they would argue that's why they're giving it three days so that people yeah, can so, actually, old people can actually get around. But if you go new registry. ones, like you and I took, my first day when I took, you know, I was with who, you know? I was with a lot, a lot, a lot of C-suites. The CEO of Nestle, CEO of Johnson & Johnson, CEO of this, that, this, that. I was like, these are all educated human beings are there to take the vaccine because they, they know the risk. They study and they know the cost benefit analysis and they say, let's do it. Boom. So for an educated fellow also doing that, then it means it's a good news. But if educated fellow don't want to go and you have to pay people money, like just to share with you in New York, they give one way free transport yeah. to the vaccination site and back. And on top of that, still not good enough. Now they give them hundred bucks credit on your transport. Yeah, they're giving them countless things. They're giving them free donuts. Right? Yeah. They're giving them on subway, yeah. at subway stations. Exactly. You know, so I understand to, that. To, 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 to intensify the take-up rate. But I don't think we need it now. But I think 
now with more and more people taking it, I think it's to open up to the younger age group and yeah. I think people will take it. Do you think, I understand that part, yeah. uh, the vaccine hesitancy, etc. But do you think that the government should start opening up the AstraZeneca vaccine registration to everyone? I because, think they should. They yeah, should. because it seems that- Because it's first come, first up basis anyway. Yeah, I mean, the first round, I think yeah. there was about 260k doses yeah, and correct. it was snapped up just like that. Yeah, correct. And this time there's more than 1 million. Yeah. But I think after a few hours, even after a day, the take up is really, really yeah. slow. Yeah. So people are saying, why are we giving, why are we wasting three days yeah. to actually let people register? They might not even register in yeah. the end. Exactly. Because again, when you're old, you know, they say this, uh, I don't know what's the exact age, 56 or 55, Prophet Muhammad passed away. 63. 63. Actually. Yeah. So you're asking the, the 63 and above to take it. He said every day is a bonus. Yeah. So why do I care about taking the vaccine? Mm. So you should go target the younger group. Because we have enough to go to, to go around as well for yeah. the old, old, old Because folks the young well, right? one is the one who is the mobile one going around. Working, etc. Uh, so they will bring the virus home. Mm. Not the father, mother, they are sitting at home. You see? So you vaccinate the young one is good for the mobility. What do you think of the vaccine uh, vaccine hesitancy? I haven't checked the figures in, in a few weeks, I'll, I'll admit, but yeah. the last time I checked, it's really, really low. Do, yeah. do you think, well, the government trying their best, yeah. putting out awareness, you know, content, yeah. Yeah. social media, TV, yeah. what have you, yeah. beefing up content, uh, beefing up uh, the capacity, pardon me, um, whether you think it's fast enough or not, it's beside the point. Yeah. But the government is basically doing everything yeah. to achieve herd immunity. But it's yeah. all for naught if not many, not enough people want to get vaccinated in the yeah. first place. Some are saying that there's a big portion who wants to wait for the phase two to be over first, yeah. see whether these people are okay, and then okay, yeah. they were on of the course. But do you think that we will eventually reach there and how long will we, we take for people, enough people to actually not be vaccine hesitant? I think three months, two, three months and you intensify with your social media and a lot of people come out, can be KOL, can be non-KL, can be educated, not educated, old and young, speak about it, their experiences. I think you can get it up. Unfortunately, my family, there are eight of us. I'm the only one vaccinated. By my choice or? By choice. Okay. None of my seven wants it at all. Some say wait and see. Some say I'm going to die from it. I was like, okay. This is alarming because you come from a medical family. Exactly. All this seven is very say alarming, no, right? except me. One fellow say, yes, I'm doing it. And I, I don't even tell them. I just said, I got my vaccine today. Boom. Why, why do they choose to wait? I mean, I, I mean, we haven't made it mandatory. Yeah. So as far as the law goes, we respect the choice. But yeah. I just want to rationalize who they're thinking because behind in, it. Because in plain, simple English, they say they are chicken. Chicken of the needle. Yeah. They they're, they're, they're afraid of the needle. They are is real it? chicken. What, what does that mean? means they have, they have no, no, they're not brave people. <laughs> well, you're talking about a very small needle because I've, I, I've know, gone through I the know. process. Yeah, the volume of the yeah, vaccine nothing, is not that big. Nothing. Very small needle nothing. Yeah. versus the possibility of getting really sick of dying yeah. because of COVID, yeah. not yeah. also zero, mentioning zero. long COVID and no, stuff like that. Yeah, correct. Still, vaccine hesitancy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They said you could be the first guinea pig. I was like, yeah, I'm still alive. I look better. <laughs> Joking. All right. So, so taking into consideration all this, right? The capacity, the vaccination rate, the vaccine hesitancy, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. How long do you reckon? I mean, somewhat the jury is still out. I mean, we've had studies saying yeah. um, different things and uh, there's a lot of moving parts and yeah. the government also has its own target, which yeah. is the PICK, the administration program will finish in February of next year, 2022. Yeah. Um, but things are still quite uncertain. How how long do you personally think we will take to actually achieve herd immunity? I think at least one and a half to two years. From now? From now. With current vaccination site and capacity, unless we double and triple, then we can do it in one year. Otherwise, it's tough. It's kind of a good thing for BookDoc because it will mean more customers, More right? business for me, for sure. I'm Obviously, I'm very happy. In this pandemic, we are, we are booming. Like well, business-wise, of course, we're business not happy with the pandemic and because there are people getting we're sick hiring and dying, a lot of right? people, yeah. yeah. But I'm not wishing anyone to die, anyone yeah. negative of any the economy sort. is crippled. Yeah, That's correct. not happy, obviously. Yeah, but but from course. a business standpoint, what I'm yeah. saying is that it gives you the, the numbers. We get very good, I always use this, huge tailwind. Not yeah. headwind, but tailwind. Yeah. And the tailwind is bringing me to uh, unexplored, unexpected territory that is 
this tailwind is something becoming like a tsunami uh, type of uh, or typhoon so big of the air that I've never seen in my life. I, wish, I will not believe also myself. Once all this is over, yeah. whenever that is, we achieve yeah. herd immunity, life goes back yeah. to yeah. quote unquote normal, whatever that means anymore, or new normal. Uh, do, do you think you will not be able to replicate the numbers that you've seen uh, in book doc for the past one and a half years because people people mm-hmm. are just returning to to their normal old life face to face doctor and everything yeah. or do you think this mindset will stick because some people are saying even after the pandemic we discovered that working from home is actually better yeah. so which one do you think it will be I think it will be 50-50 you wouldn't be 100% from home you wouldn't be 100% that they will see face to face it's still a mix because as a consumer if you have tested something bringing you convenience accessibility and cost effectiveness, there's no reason why you want to revert back to something more costly, more less cost effective and inefficient. Do you see a future where patients no longer have to visit clinic or hospitals at all, except for maybe emergency cases or yes. complicated yes, surgeries? Yes, of course. A lot of basic thing. Today, a lot of pharma companies are complaining that drug sales are dropping. Why? It's not because of COVID. It's the, after, it's the side effect of COVID. Why? Uh, yeah, I go for my cholesterol checkup. I scared I get COVID. So I'm not buying my cholesterol drugs. But it has nothing to do with COVID, but yep. because of COVID affecting that. Side effects. Side effects, exactly. Right. Yeah. So do you, do you think, um, well, of course, the, the, you know, virtual consultations, bo- uh, doctor appointments, yep. all that is already very much done online now yep. for BookDoc yep. and yep. other apps. But how about surgeries? Because as far-fetched as it may sound, some countries are actually toying with doing surgeries remotely. Yeah. You think this is they, the future? They do also robotic surgery. Yep. And a lot of surgery also has been postponed. That's why a lot of big hospitals from your IHH or KPG are also making losses because surgeries are elective. A lot of those procedures they're doing. So they're postponing. Mm. Yeah. What's next for BookDoc? Do you see yourself diversifying? Yeah. Which I told you, we started from booking. Yep. We started by having a rewards program to help people staying active. We have a teleconsult. We have a booking platform. We do vaccination. We do management of claims for companies. And we also run runs, marathon virtual runs. We run a lot of things. So our goal is to be the go-to end-to-end healthcare, digital healthcare app in the country and in the region. So it's never ending. It's ongoing. Then we're running another thing we just launched called the Round the World Challenge. So you can go to every country, checkpoint. Then later we're doing cycling. Then later we're doing a Ironman challenge and now we're going to mental health also with Dusko with Copenhagen a lot of things we are adding and adding is is non-stop and I really love the technology business because you can just add on non-stop my family business 30 years so good right from 50 outlets I open up to 200 then a few hundred thousand to millions my book dog five years I got close to a million users already and have 40,000 healthcare professionals. Look at how technology can scale businesses that a traditional brick and mortar can't. They can, but it takes time. Find a site, build, contractor, get licensing, yeah. apply. The this one way. just go right, boom. It just conflagrate and they just widespread mushroom. Next five to 10 years, like you said, it's, all, it's all ongoing all the time. Yeah. Beyond all those things that you've mentioned, the expansion yeah. plans and what you you choose, what you you plan to do, yeah. um, mid term, long term, uh, anything else? Uh, do you see BookDoc developing so- in hospital software for all? Yeah, the big we giants, have a lot of like things that? in the pipeline. Like I say, is is is, is anything is, you can is, tease for us? Uh, tease for us, <laughs> tease for you. The simple thing is, like I say, to be the end the end to end healthcare digital healthcare app that we will go in grow more in widespread of services and in depth in scope right. as well. Okay. Yeah. Finally, what's next for you? Because I, I see you as probably this Elon Musk of the medicine world or at least the digital medicine world mm. in Malaysia. Mm. You, you look like someone who can't sit still. You're yeah. all in this industry now, yeah. but there's a possibility that you'll dab into other industries going forward. Do, do you see that happening? What's next for you? My possibility... Everything is possible, but as of now, I think I've my hands quite full with with digital healthcare and with book doc. So I think I just want to double down, triple down on what I'm doing now. Thanks so much for being here.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Datuk Shafi Bey, founder and CEO of BookDoc. That's all for today. Don't forget to catch up with more on more episodes of Plugin with Mari. As usual, you can just go to any of your favorite podcast platforms, favorite podcast apps, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher. You can search for Plugin with Mari. That's M A R double I M A R I I. I'm Lukman Harris. Thanks for listening. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye. This is a Mari podcast.